So it's basically Ocean's Eleven, but set in West Virginia? Did I get that right? All right, let's unpack this. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast, where we discuss the world of film from a fresh angle. And now your host, Robert Yanis Jr. Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast. This is Rob. On this episode, we're going to be talking about Amazon Prime's new show, The Tick. And we're going to be talking about the new Steven Soderbergh film, Logan Lucky. So, uh, yeah, that's what we got going on this week. So, it's interesting about The Tick. <laughs> Not really the best segue, but what do you, what do you want from me, man? It's How do you really segue, segue into this? Um, last episode, we talked about The Monster Squad and uh, DuckTales, these late 80s properties, uh, one of which was celebrating an anniversary, a major milestone anniversary, and one of which was being relaunched into a, a new version, into bringing that character, the, those characters, that story, to a new audience, uh, sort of repackaged and reimagined in a new way. Early 90s now we've moved into, so since last week we've progressed from 1987 to what, when did the Tick show uh, premiere? Like 1990, I'm gonna, I, I haven't even looked it up yet, but I'm gonna assume it's like 1994 or something, because I did watch it uh, a little bit and I was watching Fox Kids around the same time that this show came on the air. Uh, it was during my, you know, Power Rangers period, as I like to call it. So this is based, of course, on a comic book, and then it became a TV show in the in the uh, 90s, 1984. Wow, right on. Good job, Rob. That should be the ne- name of my new. Uh, that should be the name of my autobiography. Good job, Rob. Um, but the tick in 1994. So Amazon saw that and they were like, you know what we need to do? We need another version of that that character, that that comic book that has been adapted twice to the t- to television. Let's let's do it again, but let's do it really sort of fucked up, and make it a fucked up version, and uh, that's what they're going with. So let's move into my thoughts on Amazon's new show, The Tick. Well, look at you. Impossible. You're a superhero. Good eye. I am The Tick. Well, the truth. What do you bench? <laughs> no idea. Can you fly? Tick! Good grief. Destiny's on the line, Arthur. Accept the charges. Is this gonna be a long call? Could I sit? Sure. I think it's telling just from the trailer that Amazon Studios released that the marketing materials for the tick mostly focus on, as you would assume, the titular character. However, what's interesting about this new take on the tick, which as I mentioned up front, was uh, based on the comic and adapted for animated television back in the 90s, then turned into a live action show, a short-lived live action show, I should point out, um, in 2001 with Patrick Warburton as the tick. Uh, on Fox and that show has its own little cult following and I know the original animated series um, was part of Fox Kids block back in the day was I I mean a pretty big hit at least from what I can recall I was never huge on that series Um, you know I I, I always got that it was supposed to be sort of a parody of superhero entertainment and that kind of thing but I guess I feel like I got sort of my superhero parody itch scratched by Darkwing Duck back in the day, as as I was alluding to on the last episode, uh, interestingly enough. So um, it's, it's interesting with this tick, this version of the tick, that the marketing focuses mostly on the title character, played by Peter Serafinowicz, who's still probably best known as the voice of Darth Maul. He's appeared in Guardians of the Galaxy, some Edgar Wright films. He's basically one of those that guys, that a lot of people probably don't know his name, but they've seen him a million places before. Um, he really takes front uh, center stage on the poster and the trailer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the show is not really about the tick. He's not really the main character. The focus for this series is actually the the tick sidekick, at least in the traditional sense. Uh, Arthur Everest, played here by Griffin Newman, who is uh, co-host of the popular Blank Check podcast that I've gotten super into in the last few weeks. Uh, I've probably binged in the last 
uh, in the last since the last podcast, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 episodes of that show. Uh, in addition to listening and watching other things, and and uh, a big fan of that podcast, so definitely subscribe to that if you haven't already. Um, so he really takes the the center stage, at least in these first two episodes. Um, the show has released thus far six episodes. That's essentially supposed to be the first half of season one. And I've watched the first two thus far, so this review, my thoughts, on, uh, is based just on those first two episodes. But Arthur has basically uh, witnessed his family, or witnessed his father, get murdered by a supervillain as a kid. This is not huge spoilers, because this is all in the first, probably half of the first episode. Um, so he's been sort of traumatized by that and obsessed with finding out whether that supervillain, uh, in fact, has survived sort of a legendary showdown with their local, like their their major superhero. Essentially the Superman of this universe, who's called Superion. And um, he's a, sort of obsessed with finding out whether this character called the Terror, played by Jackie Earl Haley, um, whether he exists again and he's active and he's pulling strings, uh, you know, sort of running the uh, underworld, and uh, along the way, you know, he's, he's been taking medication. And he's got a severe case of PTSD. So this show purports itself to be a superhero adventure. And it is very much that. But it's not the place that it starts at. And I feel like a lot of people that, that just pop this on based on the trailer are going to be expecting, expecting something much lighter. And, um, you know, much much more in line with the previous two incarnations of the show but this one actually takes a a darker a darker take on the tick and his mythology and considering that the show is created by ben edland who is the creator of the comic books being unfamiliar with the comic book source material myself i can only assume that this is closer in line with his vision that uh, much like characters like the mask um, the Tick's mythos and the, the exact tone that Edlin was going for probably got diluted in, uh, in the animated Fox Kids show and the, you know, the live action series and these various versions. And this is him sort of bringing his, a truer version of these characters to life. So it starts off and we're following Arthur and he's, you know, um, investigating this uh, this criminal organization and trying to find out if the terror is behind it. And the tick just randomly starts popping up. Um, he's essentially, essentially invincible. Bullets bounce right off of him. And of course, he's wearing that ridiculous blue suit with the little antennae that, you know, seem to have uh, a mind of their own. Shows up in the city to help sort of um, aid Arthur out of uh, seemingly out of the blue so a big crux of these first at least these first couple episodes are finding out you know whether or not the tick is real and uh, you know exactly what his origins are i will say that you know the actors here all give it their all i think uh, sarah finowitz who comes off a little bit oddballish in his performance but intentionally so i think in this in this show the tick is supposed to be an outsider. He's supposed to be going for a tone that makes him feel larger than life, that makes him feel out of place, that, uh, you know, so that his personality and his sort of clear cut moral black and white way of looking at things feels uh, jarring because the rest of the show is shit covered in so many shades of gray. Uh, we, I mean, Arthur is really struggling to kind of keep it together and get his life on track. And you have his sister in there. And, and uh, Yara Martinez is Miss Lint, sort of a lead, lead, another lead villainess, I guess, um, potentially working with the terror or not. I won't get into any of that. Uh, but the show kind of takes its time easing into the more ludicrous elements of uh, the larger tick mythos aside from the terror's backstory with that and uh, and the tick himself so i think th the show has an interesting an interesting tone that it's going for and uh, when i say darker the show is uh violent the show has you know language there are f-bombs and that kind of thing this is this is a uh, 
this is not the kind of show I would put on for your children. Um, so it's interesting in that it seems like Edland and the creative team here are targeting that older audience that uh, that you know may have read the comic books or may have watched the other shows, and like everything else, this is the dark and gritty reboot. Um, but whether or not that is the case, whether or not this is just like darkening a light character or portraying the darker version that this character was always meant to be, I think um, remains to you know that that's a question that I can't answer since I'm not really familiar with the source material. But the the series does nail this precise sort of uh, balance that it's going for. I can't say whether or not I love the show because like I said, it's really hard. I said this last week with DuckTales. It's really hard to base your overall feelings on a series just on the first episode or two. Um, I think the direction here by Wally Pfister who's uh, traditionally a cinematographer, who's shot the film Transcendence, but don't hold that against him. I think uh, I think the filmmaking here is really solid. I think the writing is is intriguing, um, depending on how, you know, where it all leads, I guess, is, is sort of um, up in the air. But there's a much darker subtext here involving an obsession, involving, uh, you know, a, a very murky moral sense that I think the the tick sort of comes in as basically the super ego of of the uh grander scope of the story just comes in and be like this is right this is what you need to do and I like the fact that he's all about destiny and the fact that he's so surefire and Arthur is so timid and uh finding his way and I and Griffin Newman here who like as I said I'm a big fan of his show I think he does a good job as Arthur, I think uh, the character himself needs a lot more development. But, I mean, this is only the first episode or so. Um, right now, he's just in, basically, reluctant reluctant hero slash obsessed um, PTSD survivor mode. And I have a feeling that there are many more layers to that character that we have yet to explore on the show. And, um, you know, I look forward to probably checking out the rest of this first half of the season at some point. But... Um, yeah, that's the tick. I think a lot of you out there that are interested in superheroes and you know following the whole Marvel DC thing on the big screen or on the small screen or on any screen because at this point comic book stuff is everywhere. So it makes sense that Amazon would get a piece of that. I think you will probably find a lot to enjoy in this show. Just don't expect sort of an action extravaganza. There are action sequences, but um, since the tick is basically invulnerable it isn't it, it doesn't they're not as elaborate as you might think it's basically people shooting him and him throwing them across the way uh, because he does have super strength and the like so uh, that's the tick it's available on amazon prime um, let me know what you think about it i'm curious to hear i feel like reactions to this one are going to be pretty polarizing so with that let's go into this week's featured review steven soderbergh's logan lucky <laughs> Charlotte Motor Speedway. I know how they move the money. The only guy who knows anything about blowing up real bank vaults is Joe Bang. I am in car, sir, Ray Ted. Yeah, we got a plan to get you out. Coca-Cola 600 is the biggest race of the year. We need a computer whiz. I know everything there is to know about computers, okay? All the Twitters, I know them. So Logan Lucky is essentially Steven Soderbergh's return to the director's chair. After a few years, he hasn't really made a proper big screen uh, release since, I believe, Side Effects in 2013 or so. And uh, you could tell with this film that it's... Basically him returning to the heist, the comedy, uh, drama genre that he's done so well uh, time and again. So for those of you who are not familiar with the way we do our feature presentation reviews on this podcast, I'm going to talk about the hype, I'm going to talk about the story, the cast, the production, and finally the verdict. So talking about the hype, as I said, this is Steven Soderbergh's return to the big screen, and it's really a passion project for him. A lot of this film was financed 
up front by the director and then sort of the streaming rights were sort of pre-sold that kind of thing so it had an interesting uh, release uh, I guess marketing and release uh, approach that uh, had a lot of people wondering if this was going to work and if it was going to turn a profit thus far the film has been a pretty significant disappointment at the box office I mean it has some pretty big stars which we'll get into in a minute and um you know for the sh the film to really underperform as it has and the budget's only 29 million and it's made probably about half that and it's been in theater is wide at least at least a couple weeks a few weeks after yeah as of this recording about looks like a couple weeks and uh it has not gone particularly well even though the film has garnered i'd say mostly positive reviews um you know with soderbergh's sort of uh track record and uh the uh, the l l caliber of stars here. Let's get into that. So it's produced by Channing Tatum, who takes the lead role here as Jimmy Logan. And uh, you have Adam Driver, fresh off of his Star Wars. Well, not fresh off of Star Wars, but fresh enough that everybody still considers him Kylo Ren. Um, Riley Keough, Daniel Craig, uh, Seth MacFarlane, Katie Holmes, Catherine Waterston. There's a lot... There's a lot of big, uh, big names in this film, probably most of whom took significant pay cuts, basically because they wanted to work with Steven Soderbergh. So the fact that they're in here, you would think that would boost the box office, but apparently not so much. Um, for me personally, I am, uh, you know, interested in Steven Soderbergh's work. Uh, I actually haven't seen enough of his films to really say if he's an amazing director necessarily. I mean, I think he's definitely innovative. And I think he brings a, a very specific vision. But, um, you know, I didn't care at all for Ocean's 12. And uh, I was not... I, Ocean's 13 was okay. And uh, I like Traffic, but I, I saw it when it came out on, on uh, home video back in the day. And I was probably too young to really appreciate it. Uh, or too immature. Maybe a combination of the two. I'm, I'm moderately more mature now. And although you might not find that shocking. Um... So it's, and I like Aaron Brockovich, and some of his other ones I haven't really caught up with yet. Um, so for me, he's been very hit and miss as a filmmaker. So when I heard he was involved, involved with this film, and I heard the positive buzz around it, and I saw, the, you know, I actually don't know if I saw any of the trailers for this before I, I went into it. I saw a lot of the social media marketing and that kind of thing. So I was just sort of, a, I heard positive things um, from film critics that I know, and uh, from certain websites that I visit, and and so I was intrigued to check it out. Although not, it's you know, it's not like I was going in being like, all right, wow me, Logan Lucky. Uh, I was just kind of rolling with it and uh, wanting to to uh, experience the film for myself. So as far as the hype, there wasn't a whole lot on my end with this one. Just more of a let's you know, let's check this out. I've heard interesting things type of uh, type of uh, deal. So going into the story. The story follows, as I said, Channing Tatum is Jimmy Logan, who is a uh, kind of a construction worker who's basically laid off because of a, um, an injury that he has sustained. Um, basically, he walks the whole film with a limp, and in order to sort of get back on his feet and get his life together, he's got an ex-wife played by Katie Holmes, and he's trying to uh, you know keep uh, stay close to his daughter, who is looks like is about to move with her mom and stepdad. Um, he recruits his brother, Adam Driver, uh, or that's not his character's name. His name is Clyde, but let's, he's Kylo Ren. He recruits, basically Magic Mike reach out, reaches out to Kylo Ren and, uh, they decide to rob the Charlotte Motor Speedway and they recruit James Bond to, uh, Daniel Craig to, uh, to help them break into the vault and get access to all the money that they want to get. And essentially, it's it's basically, and the film even points this out, it's basically, it's basically Ocean 7-Eleven, as the film references uh, itself at some point. It, it's essentially the Ocean's Eleven films, minus all the glitz and glamour and nice suits and, and you know, uh, big star. Well, I mean, it still has big stars, but it's not George Clooney level big stars. Um, it's... Uh, it's basically a low rent version of Ocean's Eleven in many ways. And whether or not that works for you will depend entirely on a lot of different factors. However, for me, the film, which centers on the two brothers and their sister, played by Riley Keough, 
putting together a sort of ragtag team of, uh, of criminals and uh, breaking into the NAS- this NASCAR event to, to, uh, to get, you know, get all this money didn't, to me, it felt like it was trying too hard to you, to, to, uh, tie into the established formula of what an oceans movie, what a heist movie is. And Stoder Soderbergh has done himself has done this multiple times over the past, uh, you know, 20 years or whatever, as num- many of his films, T- tie into the heist genre and I think in this one he doesn't really he thinks that by stripping stripping all the Hollywood elements of it that just leaving the fact that this is about you know a trio of siblings in West Virginia and you know sort of a down home um, you know a down home oceans film a down home like criminal enterprise that uh, that that in itself has enough charm to entice audiences to follow those same beats. And when I say that this is very much treading familiar ground is Ocean's Eleven, I mean it's treading familiar ground. I mean there are there's the put the team together montage type deal. There is the moment when they're ex- executing a plan, everything's going well, and then, oh, something goes terribly wrong. I mean, it, it, and this is a formula that Channing Tatum himself outlines in the beginning of the film. He's got a, a, a to-do list about robbing the motor speedway where he's like, shit goes wrong, and then we, we, then we fix it, and then shit goes wrong again, and then this happens, and blah, blah, blah. So the film is knowing in that It's taking you down a path you've been down many times, just sort of trying to do it in a different way. So it's one of those things where it's not so much about the plot. It's about the the tone. It's about the the clothing on the plot, whether or not it's going to be, uh, be a good time for you or be sort of a... You know, a, uh, a stroll down down memory lane, basically. Um, call to mind better films that you've seen that do this in uh, in a more enjoyable, better executed way. So that's the overall the story. The, that's the general part of the story. It's basically they need to break into Charlotte Motor Speedway. They re- recruit uh, some other characters along the way to do that. And uh, that's kind of the whole story. There's not a whole much more to it than that and the complications that arise as a result. As far as the cast, I think Channing Tatum is really uh, decent here. I don't think he really blows anything away. I think this is pretty much in his wheelhouse to play the strong, silent type who um, is basically the uh, the catalyst to get this plan in motion. He's, I guess, the Danny Ocean of this one. He's the uh, Jimmy Logan. He, his name is in the title, just like Danny Ocean. This is, I mean, even little things like that. I just little things like that. The more I think about this movie, the more I'm like, yeah, okay, that. But but, we, but that is exactly like this. I mean, there's. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I think Channing Tatum is fine here. I think he he does a decent performance. There's nothing in it that really blows me away. At this point, I think he's a much better comedic actor than he is a dramatic actor. This film is not really given that many laughs to to uh, to del- you know laugh lines jokes to deliver, and sorry I'm getting sleepy. It's it's the middle of the night and I just wanted to catch up with some of these podcasts. And uh, I think Adam Driver lays on the accent a bit thick and his performance is very affected. Uh, and um, you know so as far as your two leads, I think that they're enjoyable to watch, but neither one really has as much charisma as they have in other performances that I've seen of theirs. Um, same go Riley Keough, who I'm not as familiar with. I think she's pretty charming in here. I think she, she of the three Logan siblings, I think she clearly has much less to do than the other two. She's, it sometimes sort of comes off as an afterthought. Uh, I think Katie Holmes is really, really kind of miscast here. I think she didn't, she doesn't really, but Katie Holmes is not that great of an actress to begin with, in my opinion. Catherine Waterston, for example, was much more effective in the, the couple scenes that she has. I would have liked a lot more of her. And as far as hard as it is for me to say, Seth MacFarlane felt really miscast here as, 
as sort of this uh, over the top uh, British like business tycoon who's very famous and very excited that he's very famous. Um, his plot line involving you know his race car driver played by Sebastian Stan that did not really work for me at all. I feel like their performances were so undercooked that I didn't even barely knew who they were and barely cared. But to me, the big standout here in this cast is clearly Daniel Craig as uh, the explosives expert here, Joe Bang. It's uh, which is a hell of a character name. Talk about if you're trying to come up with a character that people are going to remember, and you want him to be basically the standout among your cast. That's that's the way to go about it. And Daniel Craig is having such a blast in this film. Um, he's really fun to watch. His accent is, of course, just as exaggerated as everyone's el everyone else's. But I think the fact that we've seen him as James Bond so many times, and the fact that we know uh, his unusual on-screen persona so well makes this performance that much more effective. Um, he's clearly the one that's sort of towing the line between serious and ridiculous the most and I think does it the most successfully and probably captures the tone that uh, Soderbergh was going for here. I feel like everyone else seems to be sort of underplaying it a bit more perhaps because they want Daniel you know the, the intention is for Daniel Craig's character to pop a little bit more since he is supposed to be this sort of uh, mythical criminal figure to the the Logan siblings but um you know, I wasn't really, I wasn't really blown away by a lot of the performances here. I thought they were, I thought they were decent but unimpressive. Let's go with that. Let's go with solid, but not really, uh, not really making much of an impact on me. Minus the fact that, um, you know, the fact that Daniel Craig really stands out. As far as the production, the film here has a really lays on thick the West Virginianness of it all, which I guess could be considered sort of a, a tribute to that region. I know Soderbergh himself is from the South. Not West Virginia, but, you know, thereabouts, I guess. He's uh, he's from Georgia, so he's familiar with the South. So I guess in that, in that way, the fact that a John Denver song plays a pivotal role in this film, the fact that the sort of uh, neighborhood vibe of these characters... And uh, that that's that sort of uh, familiarity. Um, I think Soderbergh brings an interesting tone to it that way, and I think that the music um, befits the setting pretty well. As far as the cinematography and all of that, I think Logan Lucky is uh, is pretty is pretty well done from a filmmaking standpoint. I mean. This is Soderbergh has done probably I think at this point dozens of movies, and he knows what he's doing. He knows the story he wants to tell. The question here is, is this a story that works for a sp specific viewer? For me, this felt very much like like a lesser version of something that Soderbergh has done before, and not lesser version because of the the uh, simpler way, uh, the simpler. Um, you know, less ostentatious characters or because of the West Virginia setting or anything like that. This is just a, a film that felt very familiar to me. The performances were not particularly, uh, particularly incredible that they really, um, you know, compensate for that. The laughs were there, but very sporadic. I think that the film thinks it's a lot funnier than it actually is. And I think that it tries to juggle too many balls. Giggity. Uh, I, I, at once, I feel like we're supposed to care about Jimmy and his and his you know his situation with his job and he's got this feeling these feelings for this nurse or this doctor or whatever um and then you know his the one-armed bartender played by oh i didn't even mention that so uh adam driver's character has a, has a prosthetic arm or prosthetic hand i guess uh he's a he's a war veteran and they uh, they use that to its full extent as far as you know the, the comedy is concerned um, which in a way is sort of I, you could kind of see it as disrespectful to actual um, amputees who have who have prosthetic limbs that this film one of the biggest running gags is, is his prosthetic arm and how that plays into the 
the um, the heist. Um, I forget my train of thought now. But uh, the the laughs were were very sporadic for me. The the multiple storylines with the different characters. Riley Keough, like I said, barely has anything to do. Uh, Katie Holmes and and the and that storyline didn't really go anywhere. Like there's way more going on in this film than really needs to. It feels like it's trying to convolute itself in order to change the fact that this is a story that we've seen many many times before, and uh, it doesn't really bring that much new to the table. Aside from the fact that it's set in West Virginia, and that uh, you know you maybe haven't seen it told in this way, and from that. From that respect, for that respect, I I assume I presume that Logan Lucky will be uh, be kind of a standout film for a lot of people. It just wasn't really for me. So going into the verdict, which I feel like I just said, uh, I, I didn't really plan that out particularly well. Um, Logan Lucky was a, a fun, decent film. It was a, an, an interesting way to spend uh, to spend a couple hours. Is it a film that I plan on never really revisiting? Um, probably no, probably not at all. It's, um, it didn't, just didn't bring, it just wasn't just, aside from the novelty of its southern setting and the way in that it kind of strips the heist comedy genre of its normal trappings and tries to deliver them in a, in a uh, unexpected way, there wasn't a lot here for me to want to revisit. The, the heist is not particularly... Uh, groundbreaking in any way or uh, memorable and like I said the elements of the story here the beat for beat formulaic storytelling in some ways that uh, Soderbergh relies on I mean there's the there's the big reveal at one point as far as how the heist was really planned and how it really went down and there's the sort of quasi cliffhanger ending um, much like Ocean's Eleven, that uh, that leaves audiences basically scratching their head and be like, "Well, fuck, where does that leave them now?" Um, it, it just there it had a very been there done that feel to it. Aside from, I guess, like I said, the setting, and I I hate to keep harping on that, but the film really keeps harping on that. That's sort of the whole point is that Soderbergh was got this script apparently, and it's written by a. Rebecca Blunt, which a lot of people are speculating whether or not that's a pseudonym for Soderbergh, his wife, or a friend of his or something. So we don't know exactly uh, of the story behind that. But um, as far as credited to Rebecca Blunt, but, uh, you know, other than Soderbergh being like, you know what we should do? Ocean's Eleven. But in the South. And and that basically feels like the, the pitch meeting to this production house and... Um, and for me, not enough to to really warrant repeat viewings. Uh, it's fine that it exists. It's just not really a film that 100% worked for for this moviegoer. So that's my thoughts on Logan Lucky. Uh, it's now playing. If you're going to want to see it, you should probably go see it now while it's still there because it's not doing particularly well, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, definitely check that out and let me know what you think. That's all I have for now. You can rate and review the Crooked Table podcast on iTunes if you'd be so kind. We're also on Stitcher. You can find me, Robert Yanis Jr., on Twitter, at Crooked Table. We're also on Facebook and the other social medias. You can find more podcast reviews, videos, and other movie-related goodies at crookedtable.com. Next episode, I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to talk about. I have a couple ideas, and I do want to get Freddie in here to talk the Defenders with me. Uh, probably within the next episode or two, but uh, I don't want to commit to next episode it's going to be this because I'm not sure what uh, what order we're going to be releasing them in. So until then, I've been Rob. We'll catch you around the table next week. Roll credits. This has been a production of CrookedTable.com. All rights reserved. That's the yard of a little KED.